Before I get into what I'm talking about today, I just wanted to sort of highlight what Chris talked about last week, because I, I love that we're in the book of Ephesians, right? Um, we're in a series called True Identity, and I love that. I love that we're in Ephesians. I love that we're going through an entire book of the Bible, because what that means is that you end up talking about the things you want to talk about, but then you're also touching on things that you would never naturally preach on or talk about, because it's in there. And so I love that um, we're doing Ephesians, and it's all about identity, right? In this book, Paul is talking about identity at multiple different points, right? He's saying, this is who you are in Jesus. You're seated in heavenly places. You're a new creation in Christ. And, and the identity message has been so important for me because it's really, it shaped who I am. It shaped how I operate, it shaped what, what I preach to the youth in our youth group, right? The identity message is important for them, but, but really, I, w- I would say for me as well, I had obviously had a shift when I came to know Jesus, right? You're like, oh man, I'm saved. Jesus loves me, right? I'm walking with him. He lives inside me. But I would say I, I did... Um, I did uh, it, at the time it wasn't, it was called Catalyst Training School. And I did that similar to our internship now. It was a full-time deal. I think we had class like four or five days a week. And one of the, one of the biggest things from that time was I learned about my identity in Jesus. Okay? I learned that there was a God in heaven who loved me. And these were, these were all things, you guys, that I had heard before in my mind, but for whatever reason, it was, that, it was in that season that the identity truths went from here into here. Right? It was at that time when I learned my worth, right? When I learned that God was like, John, I love you so much that I'm not just willing to resource you with a few things. You are worth the price of my one and only son dying for you. And this literally, it rocked me and it, it took me to a whole new place. Of, of just understanding that I'm not rejected, that I'm accepted, right? The truth started sinking in deep. And, and, and I would say from that point on, everything shifted. So I love, I love that we're in a series on identity. And if you're like, man, I, I, I want more of this. I want to understand who I am in Christ more. I would say get in the book of Ephesians. But I would also say this because identity is a vertical reality. And, and when I say it's a vertical reality, what I mean by that is you're not looking horizontally at other people to speak identity into you so you know who you are. You are looking vertically at the father and saying, as a daughter or as a son, who am I? Tell me. And then you get solidified. Okay? But if you're struggling in the arena of identity, and and, and this isn't part of my message, but I do want to say this. We, We advertise the freedom immersions. Like, some of you, you might need to get in a freedom immersion, right? We have that marriage one coming up because what it does, before, I I had already been a Christian for like 10 years, right? I had gone overseas as a missionary in China and and done spiritual things, but, but the truths of the gospel and what God says about me, they hadn't hit my heart in a real way. 
So a lot of what I was doing was based out of striving because I was trying to earn identity, right, and manipulate and fish for compliments so that other people can tell me who I am when it was really God vertically who's supposed to give me that identity. And what a freedom immersion does is a lot of times we have a tough time hearing vertically who God says we are because there's demonic static in the way. And it keeps us from having revelation of core identity truths. And so what happened nine years ago is I did the internship, right? I I did a freedom immersion, all that stuff. and, And I was able to rebuke and repent and get rid of the demonic static so that the vertical relationship, I could hear God clearly, right? And I knew who he said I was, okay? And, and so Chris, last week, he talked about the vertical reality. And um, I, I love that too, just even, even reading the Bible, going through an entire book, you get to see the wisdom of God, because he wrote the book, right? Through, through the inspiration, right? The Holy Spirit wrote the book, inspired Paul to write down the words. But you see the logic of God, right? Because in the first part of chapter four, what, what Chris preached earlier, he was talking about that vertical reality, right? You're a new creation in Christ. The body of sin has been done away with. You're crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live. It's Christ who lives in you, okay? All all these truths, right? Your old man is dead in the grave. Sometimes it tries to resurrect, but you just need to kick it back, right? You're, you're, you are a new person, Okay, that's why Paul in the book of Ephesians and in other letters, he says this over and over. He addresses us with an identity statement. He doesn't say you, you know, believers in Ephesus, you believers in Corinth who are dirty, slimy, scum, can't get it together, right? He doesn't curse them. He blesses them with identity and says to the saints, in Ephesus, right? To the saints in Galatia or wherever it is, right? He's saying, this is who you are. And so that's what, uh, you know, in Ephesians, it starts with identity, which is where Chris was last week. And today, so, so we're not gonna stay in, in, you know, talking about identity, but I wanted to start with that just so we have a foundation for what we're talking about today. Because today, we're gonna go vertical. We're gonna talk about what it means to actually be in community and be connected. Okay, but you have, you have to start with identity but because you can't do this well, right? You can't do it well if you don't know who you are. Being in community is tough, right? Having relationship is difficult, right? I, you, you could be married. You could have roommates. You could live in the mansion, right? Just wherever you are, right? You might, ha- you might have a honeymoon period for a little bit. Where it's like, oh my gosh, I love this. I love all my friends. I love having roommates. I love being married, right? All these different things. But at some point in time, the honeymoon's over and you have to do the hard work of navigating conflict and dealing with other people, right? And learning how to communicate all these different things. But if you don't know who you are, You're going to be looking to them to feed you, right? When you should be looking vertically to get your needs met so that when I get in into that horizontal, right, into community, I can actually come into that place with something to impart with something to give away, with, with, with some way to bless someone rather than just being like, uh, I need, I don't know who I am. Tell me who I am. Right, all, all of these things. So uh, today I titled this message and it's actually a quote from Ephesians. Uh, and I wish I had a slide for it, but if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It says, um, the title is, we are members 
one of another. We are members one of another. So this is all, it's talking about our connection to each other, right? That we're actually connected like a body would be connected, right? If I'm the knee, you're the hand, someone else is the eye, right? You're connected. You're members, you share with each other. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump into the passage. This is, and I'm gonna be reading out of the ESV. It's Ephesians 4.25 through 32. And this is, I don't have time to go into all the details of this passage because there's a lot of do's and don'ts, be like this, don't lie, don't steal, don't slander, don't be bitter, right? All these things, do this. But what what I wanna do is I wanna highlight a few key concepts that you're gonna be able to apply to your life and and apply to your specific situation. So, um, Here we go, verse 25. Therefore, right, and remember, so he's saying therefore, this is in light of knowing who you are, right? In light of understanding you're a new creation in Jesus. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For, and this is our key phrase, we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That's our other key phrase, give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And this is our second key phrase right here. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, okay? So first, I just wanna, I wanna unpack this phrase, be members one of another, okay? So Paul is talking about unity here, right? And, and he, 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 he's basically unpacking what our unity as believers is supposed to look like. Right, it's supposed to look like being members one of another, being accountable to each other, having relationship and connection with each other. It's another layer of what he's already talked about because in the book of Ephesians, he mentions the theme of unity over and over. He says, be unified in the spirit. He talks about because of Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are being unified together into the body of Christ. But what I wanna say is, is when he says be members one of another, this is so different than how the world defines unity, okay? What, what, the, what the world would say about unity is if I like, you know, your cause that you're a part of, or if I, um, you post something on Instagram and I'm like, I agree with that, then I like it, we're in unity, right? Or, or um, but if, if we vote for the same person, then we have unity, okay? And, and this, this can get... This is hard because if that's all that the world says unity is, we just come into agreement, then, then that can be cut short at any point in time, right? As soon as, and it's happened, you guys, in my own family, right? I have family members who literally half the family voted for one person and the other half voted for the other person and literally now they're estranged from each other. 
right? If your unity is only based in, well, well, I voted for this person, or I watch this, and you watch that newscast, and, or, or we watch the same stuff on TV, then as soon as you disagree, that can be broken. And we're seeing this in the world today, right? Unity is this, like, really fragile thing where it's as, as, soon, as soon as you don't agree with me, you're done, canceled, over, we're not friends with, break relationship, all of that. And guys, we can bring this into the church, right? We bring it into the church when we're like, well, I signed a doctrinal statement, you did too, I guess we agree, I guess we're done, that's it, we can go our separate ways. Right, and and the thing is, I I signed a doctrinal statement too, right? I'm not saying that's bad. We need to come into unity on certain points of theology, but what I'm saying is that there's more than that. It's more than just saying, oh, I liked your Facebook post, or oh, I'm gonna support your charity, or whatever. Christian unity literally means we're connected into a body, so that when there's, there's harm done to the leg, that it affects the rest of the body. We can't be like the world that just says, you know what, if I don't agree with you, I'm gonna cut you off. Well, when you do that, then you no longer have a leg and you're trying to walk around as a body, but you're cutting people off because you're saying all that unity is, is we think the same things. When what, what Paul is saying is Christian unity goes so much deeper than just we have the same thought, right? It means I'm accountable to you, not in a controlling way, right? Not in a you have to report to me kind of way, but in a I'm concerned about you and I love you. We get, we get a picture of this in Acts, uh, it's in Acts 2.44, it says this, and, and, and this is in, the, they were basically, the early church was experiencing revival, right? The Holy Spirit had come down, tongues, prophecy, people thought they were drunk, the whole deal. This is, this is what was going on. And then it says this in Acts 2.44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they shared with anyone who was in need, Okay. Notice it doesn't say, right, they just, they, they agreed on certain things and called it good. No, they were actually willing to give of their lives to other people, okay? So if, if, this, is, if this is the reality we're called to, if this is the level of horizontal connectedness that Jesus is asking us to walk in, I just wanna highlight a couple of things that can hinder this, okay? A couple of concepts from this passage that hinder walking members one of another. So if you're taking notes, the first thing that can hinder being members one of another is wrong agreement. Wrong agreement hinders being members one of another and walking in community. What I'll say about agreement, agreement is very powerful, okay? You you can look at it in the scriptures, two passages. Um, I I won't go into them super deep, but the first one is Ecclesiastes 4.12. says this, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Right? When you come into agreement, it's hard to break that. Second one, Matthew 18, 20 says this, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Agreement is powerful. So literally, when I come into agreement with someone, when I meet with someone and say, you know what, we're gonna worship the Lord, we're gonna pray about something, it's like a Holy Spirit vacuum and it attracts the presence of God and God's like, I wanna be in on this. I wanna agree with you, right? Prayers get answered. Power is released. Agreement is powerful. And and here's the other thing I wanna say about agreement opportunity comes through agreement. What do I mean by that? 
See, I can't, as one person, just decide I'm going to do something, right? I, I can't just create an opportunity by myself or something. What, what do I mean by that, right? I can't just decide, hey, I'm going to go to Starbucks and get a job, right? I can't go to Starbucks, right, and, and go behind the counter and say, well, I'm ready to make frappuccinos, right? I'm making my Java chip, whatever it is. Here you go. Everyone who works there would be like, what are you doing? Like, we don't know you. You don't work here, right? We haven't come into agreement about this job opportunity. It takes two people to decide if I get a job. It takes me being like, I, I want to work at Starbucks, but then it also takes a manager coming into agreement and saying, this is the right person. When that takes place, an opportunity is created and I have a job. Okay, how does this work in this passage? I'm, I'm gonna read it. So this is Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. It says this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. How do you give the devil an opportunity in your life? Through agreeing with him. See, the devil is not like God, right? God is sovereign. God is God. God is uncreated. That means that God gets to do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. But the devil is a created being who has limited authority, so he doesn't just get to run the show. He has to find a partner that he can agree with, so he gets an open door, so there's opportunity for him. So notice, you can see in the passage, it says, do not uh, uh, be angry, but don't sin. See, just... Just having an emotion isn't coming into agreement, right? We have lots of emotions, right? I have lots of emotions. Sometimes I feel this way. Sometimes I feel that way. It's when I make that shift into agreement that it provides the door of opportunity for the devil, okay? That's why he says, like, look, you're fine if you just feel angry, but don't let the sun go down on it. Right? Don't let it linger because when that happens, that's when you start agreeing with the accuser over your life, over someone else's life, and then he has free reign. Then he has authority because he's like, hey, you gave it to me, right? We both decided you were going to get this, right? You, you, you had faith for this. Right? I'm not talking about good faith. I'm talking about bad faith where you're agreeing with the wrong person. Right? And then, and then something gets established. And, and so the first thing I would say is this. Where, where have you made an agreement not with God but with the devil? Right? Today is the day where we get to break those agreements so I'm not operating in all this rejection, right? The devil's like, you're rejected, you're rejected. And I'm like, wait, I am rejected. And then I walk in community and I can't operate members one of another because I'm believing all these lies about who I am, right? And, and we have an example of this in the person of Jesus because Jesus understood agreement fully. He fully agreed with the Father. He was in full unity with his heavenly Father. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing, right? And, and because of that, he was able to expand the kingdom of God in a way that no one else ever was able to do. Every single thing. Even when it got hard, right? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's like, uh, I don't want to do this. God, what, what do you want me to do? I want you to go to the cross. Okay, I'm in full agreement. I'm not holding back. You guys, we need to agree fully. 
about the purposes of God over our life. And you need to cut out every, every lie the enemy has spoken over you. Because it's an opportunity for him to wreak havoc in your life and in the community. So, so, and I'm skipping ahead, but I'm just saying we'll have an opportunity to do that today because Jesus, even Jesus himself, you guys, he never agreed. He fully agreed here and he never agreed here, right, with the devil. How, how do we know this? Check this out. This is powerful. John 14, 30 says this. This is Jesus talking Literally, right before he gets crucified, he says this, I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing on me. What does that mean? It means there was literally no point of agreement between him and the devil. Full agreement here, no agreement here. The devil tried to make it happen, right? In the, in the desert, when he goes out, the devil's like, hey, you know, if you're really, um, you know, if you're really who you say you are, then do this, do that, right? He's always trying to find partnership, right? Trying to find that point of agreement, but never did the son agree with him, right? And, and he's calling us into that level of obedience, that level of just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm only doing what I see God doing here, right? I'm only doing this. Because here's the deal, this is this agreement thing, and I, I just wanna say one more thing about agreement, right? Jesus, because he was in full agreement with God, fulfilled the full purposes of God, he was able to redeem Every way mankind came into agreement with the devil. What do I mean by that? You go back to Genesis, what happened with Adam and Eve, right? They were in agreement with God, we're good, God's good, we're gonna tend the garden, all this stuff, and then what happens? The enemy comes because he wants authority, he doesn't just naturally have it, right? He's a created being, what does he do? He goes to Adam and Eve and says, hey, you know, God's not really that good. Actually, he's withholding from you. Did you know if you ate this fruit, you can actually become like him? Right, the truth of the matter is they were already like God. Remember, God, uh, Satan's, he's the father of lies. They were already like him because they were made in his image. But what did Adam and Eve do? They believed the lie, came into agreement, ate the, ate the fruit, and gave their authority to the devil to wreak havoc, you guys. And it wasn't like when they sinned, when they made agreement, because here's, here's another lie, here's another deception, is that your sin is just your sin. But that's not what happened. Literally, when they came into agreement with the devil, their sin affected every generation that ever came upon the earth, even to this day. Right? We're born into Adam and Eve's sin, as crazy as that sounds. That is the reality because of agreements they made thousands of years ago, right? Long time ago with the devil. So we have to understand this is a fear of God moment where you understand that your sin and your agreements with the devil are not just your little thing. There's not some quarantine around your sin. You don't have some plastic bubble around your sin where you get to say, well, well, my lust and my greed and my unforgiveness, that's just my little deal, right? Because it affects the whole community. Right? And so I, I just, I want to stir that up in us, not that we would be condemned, right? But that we would be convicted to make the right agreements, right? So we can actually walk this thing out and not have, not have our sin affect the entire body. Because that's why in the Old Testament, right? Sin, the symbol of sin in the Old Testament is leprosy. What does leprosy do? It doesn't just affect one person, 
right? God was so serious about this because he knew if someone gets leprosy, a skin disease, it will infect the entire community. And what has to happen in the law, it says those people need to be taken out of the community until they can get better. Right? So, so today we're going to have an opportunity to repent of any way we've decided, right? There's no judgment. There's no, um, you know, you're a terrible person, this and that, right? Remember, we know our identity. We know who we are in Jesus. We just get to break every agreement with the accuser. And so I, I, I believe we're going to get set free today and we're, and we're going to see, we're going to be able to manifest being the body of Christ in the earth, right? That's fully connected, fully allowing every member to be who they're made to be, okay? And, and last point, um, and then we'll, we'll pray, is this. Um, the second way you hinder being members one of another, right, operating in community is by grieving the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? So remember, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just like this ethereal force that floats around, right? Remember, we serve one God, three persons. That means that the Holy Spirit has a personality and, and we can make him sad, right? <laughs> Grieve him, literally, through our sin. We can lie to the Holy Spirit, we can quench the Holy Spirit. This is all according to the scriptures. But we can also welcome the Holy Spirit. So I want to, because we are made to be a temple, like we're made to house the Holy Spirit individually. But there's also Bible verses that talk about not just me, not just me individually in my room when I go home and, and pray to God, right? Us corporately as we come into agreement, right, as we break off agreement with the devil, right, the Holy Spirit wants to fall, okay? He wants to inhabit his bride, right? He wants to inhabit a bride that's fully connected, right, fully not compromised in sin, right? And, and you see this in Ephesians 2.22 says this, in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place. So being built together, that's us, not me individually. Us corporately, we're being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. God won't dwell in a temple that is steeped in compromise. I know that's hard to hear, and I wish I could like soften that, but it's just reality, right? In the book of Ezekiel, he has this vision, right, of, of priests literally worshiping idols in the temple. And then what happens? What was the result of that? Literally, Ezekiel sees the presence of God slowly leaving the temple, and then it's gone, Right? We want to be a bride that's fully committed to who God is. So we're going to pray. If we could have the worship team uh, come on up. I know that that's, it's intense, right? This is, it's, it's weighty. I can, I can feel it in the room, right? That, that we're, t we're talking about um, just areas where me, we might need to give up some things. We might need to break agreement. We might need to repent of that one way we individually are grieving the Holy Spirit. And we thought our unforgiveness and our bitterness, that was just our little thing. Right, And we're like, well, I can be bitter and I can be this. And, and everyone else is like, no, 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 it's affecting the whole community. You think you're quarantined, but literally it's touching everyone else here. And, and so we're going to have a moment just to get free of some of this stuff so that we can manifest the reality that we're called to manifest, right? Members one of another. So let's pray. Go ahead and if you want, just close your eyes.
Jesus. I thank you that you're coming for a bride. I thank you you're coming for individuals. I love that. But I, I thank you also that you're coming for a bride, for a connected bride who's operating as the body with Jesus Christ as the head, with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, a temple built up with the foundation of the apostles and the prophets raised up that can house the fullness of the presence. We just say we're sorry. We're sorry for every area of compromise. We just say we're sorry for every agreement that we've had with the devil. And we just say we're done being compromised. We're done just, just giving over authority to the devil because we didn't know or we just thought it would be easier. We want to have full agree with, agreement with you, Jesus. Come in, even right now, even right now. And I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit to speak to each of you. I believe he's gonna bring things to mind, areas of agreement, right? Where you've agreed with the devil over your life ways that you've grieved the Holy Spirit, whether it's been bitterness, unforgiveness, lying. That passage talked about unclean things coming out of our mouths. That grieves, it literally saddens the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, just speak right now, speak right now. What is it? Where's the agreement? for forgiveness. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as just repenting. Saying, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry for harboring bitterness. I'm sorry for agreeing with the devil over my self-image. Some of you, it might be multiple things. That's okay. Just take this moment, take advantage of this moment and just get it all out there. There's other things, I need prayer. Let's, let's go ahead. Um, actually, you know what? I'm just sensing something different. Let's just, if you wanna come to the altar, if you're like, man, I, I need to give a physical expression for what I'm feeling in my spirit, right? If, if you're like, I, I want my body to be in alignment with how I'm repenting, I just wanna invite you to come up to the altar. Let's all stand up. We're just gonna worship. We're gonna take some time to worship. You've been set free. When you repent, you get set free. So I believe we're gonna be experiencing a new reality, even in this community of what it means to truly walk members one of another. So let's just worship him. Feel free to come up if you wanna come up to the altar and just pray and receive. <laughs>